Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christopher Riopel. I am the uh, Neil Westreich Curator of Post-1800 Paintings here at the National Gallery uh, and the curator of the exhibition about to, to open, Ed Rouché, Course of Empire. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Alistair Souk, the critic at large uh, of uh, The Telegraph, uh, BBC series only a few months ago on I BBC so. Four. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an interesting critic of, of Ed, who uh, interviewed Ed Rouché in Los Angeles not so long ago. That makes it sound hostile, but not at all. There's, um, <laughs> it was a great experience, and perhaps something that we can talk about a little bit tonight. Yes. And then, uh, of course, we are very honored to have uh, Ed Rouché uh, with us here, the first time his work is being shown at the National Gallery, certainly not the first time uh, it has been shown in in uh, London. We like to think we, we have followed your career uh, very closely. Thanks in particular, I think, to Anthony Doffe, who first began showing you here in a big uh, uh, retrospective exhibition not so many years ago across the river at, uh, at the Hayward, uh, and uh, now here at the National Gallery with this, dare I say, by this point, almost legendary uh, series of paintings, Course of Empire, uh, done in two sessions, if you uh, will, 1992, the monochrome works that here are shown above, and uh, then in preparation for the, Venice, for the American Pavilion of the Venice Biennale in 2005, the second series uh, in color, returning to the same sites, uh, but seeing how they are different after 12, 13 uh, years, uh, a, a series of paintings that evoke great interest in Venice in 2005, and then at the Whitney Museum uh, in New York early the following, uh, following year. This is the first time they've been brought back together again, um, uh, and it is uh, thrilling for us in the context, obviously, of the concurrent exhibition, uh, Thomas uh, Cole, Eden to Empire, and we will, of course, talk about why that is. But you wanted to say something about the installation, or? I, I did a little bit. I mean, uh, my feeling is that this is such a refreshing coup for the National Gallery to have this show here. I think it's a really brilliant thing, and I'm sure that everyone in this room who hasn't seen it yet and will afterwards will agree. And one of the things that struck me about it, and I wondered whether it's something that Ed might comment on, is you mentioned this body of work called Course of Empire, it consists of these two series, one you did in the 90s, the so-called blue-collar paintings, and then the paintings that you, the updates, if you like, that you did for Venice. And this is the third time they've been shown all together. But as we can see from the picture of the installation, it's quite distinctive, because previously, my understanding is, I didn't see it in Venice in 2005, but there were the two galleries in the American Pavilion, and one group was in one, the other group was in the other. And then when it was shown at the Whitney, they were shown along two walls. And I wondered, I mean, clearly here, this has been partly dictated by the size of the room, which I think we, Ed is nodding, that is true. Um, <laughs> but there, there is an element, I wonder whether it gives any new nuance for you, looking at the work again now, to see them hung in this, in this particular way. Uh, it does, and uh, the room, when I first looked at it, I thought, well, I'm, I'm a kind of person that likes things in a linear fashion, one next to another. These are like question and answer paintings, and so generally I think about that as being side by side, and of course, right away I could see that this was not, the room was not big enough, didn't have enough wall space, but immediately this other thought came about, and this is the only way to show these paintings. And it was almost like the room was made for the paintings. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm truly honored to have it happen that way. And it's, it's just, um, it was such a fortunate thing to have the room be like it was, even with the, the uneven walls. There's a slightly uneven wall on, on one side, and it just, it was perfect for all the way that, that the works hang. There's a particular detail about the installation where the black and white works, I think there's a technical word that I've forgotten, but they, they sort of come out slightly, they tip outwards, don't they, at an angle from the wall. Yeah, I think they call that skying. Sky yeah, skying. Yeah, skying, yes. And they've done it for hundreds of years, but it maybe fell out of fashion 
250 years ago. Right. And so I thought it. Oh, come on with the latest trends. That's yeah. yeah. And uh, also, I felt like the paintings up above would be if hanging absolutely flat against the wall would be a little too solemn. You know, like there's some, something snooty about them if they're like that. So I thought bringing them down in the, into the room makes them a little warmer, a little can, easier to look at. Can, this may sound rather stupid as a question, but why have you put the black and white ones above rather than the other way around? Um, Again, I, I think uh, top to bottom, I, that's just the way I read. Maybe it's uh, some habit from childhood, something like that. That, <laughs> uh, yeah, that the, makes a lot of sense. The questions I think we do seem all read to be, like that. yeah, the question painting seemed to be better on top than it did on bottom. And yes. plus I like that uh, all the way on bottom with the um, accent of color. Fair enough, that was a stupid question. Um, should we, should we think a little bit about, because we have some slides which actually show um, better kind of images of the paintings, but first, maybe it's worth talking about the inspiration for the series, which of course can also be seen here at the National Gallery at the moment. Thomas Cole's series, created in, I think the 1830s. 1836, Chris. it is shown in New York. He's been contemplating it since 1829, very soon after he arrives in London in 1829. Cole makes a notation that he can see, uh, he can forecast a series of five paintings f uh, tracing the rise and fall of a great civilization. Uh, and he's thinking about that for the entire time he is in Britain, in Italy, uh, looking at the ruins of antiquity, meeting the contemporary artists. Then he goes back to New York and paints them, uh, as I say, revealing them to <coughs> To, uh, to the world in uh, nine, 1836. Is it worth just quickly scrolling through, we can see the arc of, these, yes. of the sequence. So the first one you saw was that was the first, savage state? Is the that savage state. Notice that the mountain uh, always remains in the picture. It is the one constant. Uh, and the time of day advances. So you're looking not only at thousands of years of history, but at, of, at one day as the sun passes through the sky. So. Uh, the savage state, the pastoral state, art begins to enter, mathematics, science, farming. There's a detail here that I love, which is there's a small boy in the foreground doing a kind of sketch that looks rather, well, childish, yes. um, which is a completely different style, but I thought that was a rather lovely um, thing to have in the foreground. Well, famously, the father of painting, Giotto, was discovered as a child drawing uh, on, the, on the ground, and I think he's referring to that. There's also something that looks like Stonehenge in the middle ground. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. The, the series then reaches its consummation in the painting called Consummation, uh, this great imperial uh, capital that looks a lot like Carlton House Terrace and Regent Street <laughs> and Regent's Park. And indeed, I'm sure it, it, London was the only great imperial city um, he, uh, a modern imperial city he saw, and so he was very affected uh, by, by how it looked in, the, in 1830. Uh, but already the canker of decline is setting in pride and uh, gluttony and lust. And it sets in in quite a big way in the next image in the sequence, doesn't it, where, um, well, it's curtains for this civilization. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, London's still standing. I don't remember this happening to Regent's Park, but... <laughs> And then, uh, the, finally, the, uh, it's all over. The ruins are there. Yes. So but the, the hope of renewal is also there, perhaps. So ordinarily, these paintings hang, I think I'm right in saying, in, in New York. The New York Historical Society. Had you already seen these, Ed, when you did the first part of your course of empire, the blue-collar paintings in the 90s? Were these in your mind already yeah. then? Yeah, I think I, uh, I knew about those paintings. I came across those by accident maybe in 1980 or something at the New York Historical Society and I walked through them and then I stopped, backed up and finally realized, hey, there's a series of paintings done by a man who really tackled a subject that has never been done before in art that I know of, which is, shows the passage of time in a series of, of, of paintings. Someone's gonna correct me soon about that <laughs> and say, oh no, look back at those. But I can't think of any other example except maybe 
portrait of Dorian Gray <laughs> or something like that, that where there's a, a concentrated effort to show a, like a tale from beginning to end, which this did. And so I knew about these paintings. My first black and white paintings didn't really, I wasn't referring to this, to this at all. Well, they, they have a feeling of being uh, quite end-like in themselves. Uh, because if yeah. we have a look at some of the series there, then if you, um, we can see, you know, through the series, we can see the top ones are the black and white ones, the blue collar paintings from the 90s. And when I look at them, I see something that feels almost quite funereal. Clearly, it's the palette, sure, but also the architecture, this box-like yeah. LA architecture, just yeah. quite boring, in a way, LA buildings. They yeah. look almost like tombs or monuments. Uh, good, good point. Um, um, it's like I was sort of investigating the anxiety of, of uh, living in a city like Los Angeles. Although these are not, I mean, these are imaginary. And, um, but they're based on things I, I've seen in the, in the city and industrial parks and all that. I mean, one noticeable thing, just again on this slightly, the, 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 the theme of decline, if you like, is it's quite noticeable that the buildings have um, letters writ large on the side which are the names of the particular business company organization that they're inside and if we look at the black and white ones well here we have tires the american spelling um but that's rather lovely wordplay um in the sense that it clearly feels like it's a culture a class the blue collar part of society that's exhausted coming to an end we have tool and well die i mean mm -hmm. there it is um, yeah. The telephone booth, which is about to disappear, all of these beginning with T, which is something that's always perplexed me. Is, is there a reason for that? Absolutely unintentional. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because uh, I had a whole theory. Circumstantial. But, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a surprise to me. I think yeah. you're the first person that, that mentioned that. And well, I got it from Chris, it. so that. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, but I, uh, whatever mystery can be made out of that, I'm, I'll stand behind. Well, <laughs> I, I had this feeling that it was almost cross-like, and perhaps there's some religious significance to, um, well, to the painting. I just put it out there. You're but... expanding on that. That's a good thought. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll uh, accept that, too. Well, partly because you have this heavenly radiance that suddenly, in, in some of them, if we're just looking at the skies, like here, it feels like... Um, well, here the blue-collar workers have died and hopefully are about to go to heaven. Uh, you can look at it that way. <laughs> uh, I was yeah. sort of wondering, and Tool and Die particularly fascinates me, a painting of 1992, Tool is a word of sexual slang, Tool and Die, is it about AIDS? Oh, well, no, that's uh, <laughs> another circumstantial thing. <laughs> Come on, that's brilliant. I got I mean, rid of that with the second <laughs> painting. Yeah. So, so <laughs> if we, so you, you created the series in the nineties. Yeah. And if we fast forward about a decade, you were invited to represent America at the Venice Biennale. At this point, is is that when you suddenly thought to yourself, had you already thought you might want to create something like this, a version of Thomas Cole's Course of Empire, or was that the trigger? Um, you know, I worked at it, and I had these paintings. I, I had an exhibit of these black and white paintings at the Tony Schifrazi Gallery in New York in uh, uh, early 90s. And uh, I kept all of these paintings, and they, uh, so I, I just would look at them for a decade before this other thought came about. And then that developed into something, and I, it, it uh, then Thomas Cole came back to me, and I thought, I might be doing the same thing here. Maybe I'm, I'm echoing his statement. And so I think it moved that way. I wonder, we talked a little bit about the fact that this is the third time they've been shown together, and that's over a period of time. And I wonder whether you feel that the meaning, the resonance, some of the nuance of your Course of Empire series has also changed as the political climate has changed in America. Because it strikes me that these paintings are very prescient in some ways of many of the concerns that, um, although 
I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I imagine you don't share his politics. Donald Trump has articulated and has won him office, in a sense, when he was campaigning a couple of years ago. Um, a sense of blue-collar decline, a sense of American industry failing, a sense of other cultures abroad stealing secrets. I mean, here, for example, we can see the tool and die building has been taken over by um, possibly a Korean, but a sort of Asian uh, company. There's um, a very unsettling but brilliantly named corporation called Fat Boy that's taken over Tech Chem. Mm. Do, is that, do you feel there's anything to that, that um, in some ways you see some new resonance given recent events in, in American political culture? Well, already these, these paintings, the, the later paintings are already uh, X number of years old, so uh, they don't really include even uh, Obama's presidency. <laughs> So um, where it comes from, it has a little bit to do with uh, my sarcastic outlook of the vision of the future and of the present state. And so these are just exercises and, uh, and uh, I'm trying to open up a little door. I think all artists want to do that. They want to open the doors to heaven. and. Um, Maybe this is a stab in that direction. So they're not, uh, I don't have political statements behind these images. The actual buildings themselves intrigue me, certainly, because, you know, as we can see from these pictures, they're all very utilitarian, generic, box like, really quite drab, the kinds of buildings that I think most of us would overlook, ignore, certainly wouldn't be minded to make monumental paintings about. What is it about this architecture that appealed to you? Um, I guess I, I've always responded to the basic ideas of architecture, uh, which can, certainly includes the box. And uh, so I view it as boxes with words on them. And so it's just another way to explore that idea of language and putting things on boxes. So it, it offered me a great opportunity to delve in that direction. I, I wonder if there's something as well about um, Los Angeles, where, of course, you studied there. You arrived in the city. You didn't grow up there, but you arrived in mid-50s, I think, and have basically you've been based there ever since. And much of your work deals with LA, chronicles LA, um, Hollywood features prominently. Um, how have you seen the city change in that time? Because this vision doesn't seem enormously optimistic, if you like. Um, well, these are like triggers for thought. I mean, they're, they're just opening little doors. They don't give you answers necessarily. And they also, these, the imagery here doesn't necessarily, I'm not trying to imitate Los Angeles or uncover anything that make a message about Los Angeles. This could be anywhere in mainly the United States, but you could expand that to the world and you could say, we see boxes in Indonesia with writing on them. So, and if you, can you back up one uh, there uh, or two? Uh, well, this one now, uh, um, I had to change tool and die. Tool and die to me was something uh, rigidly industrious and industrial. And I, w I wanted to make a, a step beyond that, almost in the way that, um, that Cole would do his pictures, except he has his envisioned <coughs> possibly thousands of years gone by, hundreds to thousands of years between the first and the fifth painting of his. Mine are a handful of years. And you could even say, well, six months ago, we used to have tool and die, and now we have this other one. <laughs> and um, I drive around a lot in Los Angeles, and I see Korean light, uh, writing everywhere, calligraphy. And I um, made, took photographs, made drawings, came up with this kind of language here that uh, I thought would be perfect for this building and perfect for the box. And um, uh, we even had some Korean people come by and, and look, at the, uh, look at the paintings. 
And they said, well, oh, I see Korean, Korean writing, but you know what? It doesn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, to I like the fiction of it. The fiction of it is fine. And uh, also there's a kind of hard to see almost edge to the right, uh, the very, uh, uh, the right the graffiti. side is graffiti, which I also see a lot of in LA. So it's just a combination of this cultural clash that uh, I was portraying in this panorama. I, I, I love the translation of um, tradition. It's not just coal. I was just thinking, looking at the bottom image here, I mean, one of Cole's big influences was Claude, of course. Yes. And here you have almost a synopsis of a Claude <laughs> painting, beautiful sunlight in the background, a prominent tree in the foreground, <laughs> and something, well, the post representing a building maybe you might see on, on the left. Um, these, we, I know, Ed, you wanted to include these slides at the very last minute, which, um, and I wondered, what, what are these two paintings here? These are in the show downstairs. These are in the show, and they are a very interesting anticipation of uh, what Ed is doing in Course of Empire in that they are the same site painted by Cole, site in the Catskills, seven or eight years apart, one of them idyllic, pastoral, lovely family, enjoying nature, at one with nature, and now Cole is coming back and showing only seven or eight years ago that this very site has changed. The trees are being cut down. This man with a jug of liquor beside him has been hewing them uh, down. Most uh, importantly, the railroad runs right through it now like a slash across the landscape, something that worried Cole a very great deal. And it is the earliest train in art. Is it? In painting, uh, the earliest train, or moving train, one year before Turner's rain steam, steam and speed. Uh, but here he is, as I say, Cole looking at what can happen even rather rapidly in a landscape. I, I find it extraordinary to think about this, um, these links, if you like, between Ed's work and Thomas Cole's. Because I think a phrase you've often used in the past where you, these subtle connections can be drawn is silver threads sensing these silver threads between things. And what you're describing there, Chris, I wonder whether, you know, a big thing for Thomas Cole was that he was very concerned with the environment, the natural world. Yes. He believed that modernity was a risk, that it could destroy it. And I know that when I met you recently and interviewed you in your studio, Ed, you were talking about the fact that the national parks in America are very much under threat. And I wonder whether you, you feel a, a kinship, if you like, with Cole that goes beyond just the, the course of Empire well, cycle. absolutely, yes. And um, uh, he was a Luddite, and uh, so, and he, any kind of advancement on society, any, any sort of progress, in quotes, he was against. He didn't want tr uh, clear cutting of forests. He hated the, um, uh, you know, he hated the railroad. Uh, he would be dismayed to be alive today. I mean, he would, and also his message, when he finished those paintings, uh, information was so slow to move that it, I'm sure that his, those five paintings, Course of Empire, were not seen by anybody for maybe 75 years, maybe close to the mm -hmm. turn of the uh, 20th century. century. Uh, I don't know, but it's uh, so different in his day than, than in ours that uh, it's kind of shocking. I mean, you say shocking, and I just wonder whether it's worth pursuing this kinship idea, because the thing I think I felt most shocked by, almost, when I came to interview you, was I was thinking, here is an artist known for these great, painting these great icons of America, the gas stations, the Hollywood sign. And at one stage, partly sparked, as it were, by considering your course of Empire Cycle, I said, um, I asked you whether you considered yourself a patriot. And your response was, well, I don't have an iPhone, um, <laughs> and I've never been to McDonald's, and I've never been to Disneyland. I thought this was quite unbelievable. Um, uh, there's, that, that shows my, where I am with patriotism. <laughs> <laughs> but is there a sense, again, of that sort of um, modernity as well? Because I know that you don't, you don't work with computers. Um, you call yourself a paper and pencil guy. I do, yeah. Um, and um, so I, I move slow in, in the regard to modern communication. And uh, 
that's why I back up in, in uh, history to, for inspiration, and I think it happened here with this gentleman, and uh, um, I'm sorry he's not here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I'm asking slightly whether you look around at the culture um, and feel a sense of b feeling jaded in the way that perhaps Thomas Cole may have done when he was looking at America in its infancy, in a sense, and uh, expanding so rapidly, profiteering, so ambitious. He, he was suspicious somehow of it. He, he wasn't totally happy with the way his, that con the country was. No, not at all, but uh, he was totally committed to landscape painting, and he would set up his canvas and paint what's out there like this, exactly the opposite of the way I do it. I mean, mine are imaginary, but his paintings also contain um, imagination. Well, I mean, he's, he's taken, well, how about this one? Yeah. This is the goblet. Sublimely silly. Yeah. Sublimely uh, silly. <laughs> I believe this, this was included in a surrealist Yes, exhibit. yes, um, at yeah. the Museum of Modern Art. Yeah, Museum of Modern Art. And uh, so uh, this is a sidestep in his career that uh, I don't know, I don't think we know how he feels about this. But um, 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 I liked what he said about his course of empire. I think he called it a mutation of earthly things. Yes. And uh, it was just his way of uh, delineating it. And this painting um, also caught me by surprise. Yes. I can, I can see why that would appeal to you, given uh, the importance, I guess, of surrealism as a hinterland for, for your work. But it, it, I wondered whether it was worth just reconsidering this image from The Course of Empire, the destruction panel. Um, noticeably, there's this great conflagration and forgive me for this is quite literal, perhaps a little obvious, but you're very well known for your paintings of burning buildings, burning standard gas station. Uh, this, I think, is a restaurant. Norm's was a, a chain of restaurants in, um, in America, and perhaps most famously, the Los Angeles County Museum on fire. Um, I s assumed that that was partly why you were drawn to the Cole series, that there was a <laughs> seeing a man who was interested in a similar theme. And I wondered why you've been compelled to depict civilization aflame so often. Um, different subjects uh, intrude in my life, and I've never had uh, uh, catastrophic experiences with uh, the subject of fire, but I've always liked the, the look of it, uh, the graphic look of it, the pictures of it. Uh, I, I'm not attracted to fires necessarily, but I, the idea of adding something to a painting, I can't explain that. It's just that it uh, seemed to have a very natural extension of whatever the architecture was happening at the time. And these two paintings, well, you know, like Ophelia here, I felt like this L.A. County Museum painting is uh, very closely linked to that painting of Ophelia, John well, Everett Merle. I Merle mean, it, it might be worth, I, I think, expanding on that, because most people might look at that <laughs> juxtaposition uh -huh. and scratch <laughs> their no. heads. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. Th there's a nice context to this, actually, thinking about Thomas yes. Cole as well, because, as Chris said at the beginning, Thomas Cole went on this grand tour. Three years, he came to Europe back to England and went on to Italy. And you did something similar in, I think, 61. Uh, you went on a big trip around Europe with your mother and your brother, I think. Yeah. Um, you spent time during that in England. And yeah. this was one of the paintings that you encountered at the Tate, Millet's yeah, Ophelia. Yeah, and uh, of course, you know, you have a misfortune here in a very uh, uh, sweet uh, context. And I, I felt like my painting of the County Museum on fire was also a misfortune uh, that was portrayed in something that's very quiet and bucolic. And, and so I felt like it was the same sort of thing. <laughs> Is there something, I mean, I know when we met before, you talked as well about the, the angle that we see Ophelia at and that you've you borrowed that almost as a compositional device 
for this painting? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, the tabletop kind of obliqueness, uh, the subject of, you know, w looking at things from an oblique position. And uh, that really caught me, and I like the uh, diminishing lines and all that <laughs> that happens when you look at something from an oblique. So somehow that uh, meant a lot to me, and I've uh, exercised it in <coughs> different works. We, beyond this. We've included another work of art that I know that this did catch your eye in 61 because there's a note that you made about it. This is a, a bust of um, <laughs> Mussolini, I believe, mm. by an Italian artist. Bertelli? Bertelli, yeah. Um, the artist from the 30s, and um, uh, this was called The Endless Mussolini. And I looked at this, I couldn't <coughs> see a face in there until I read the title of it. This was at the Imperial War Museum, Museum here. And I think this is maybe not the example that, uh, uh, he did four or five different examples of this same image. Um, and I think I saw a version that was made of blown glass or something mm -hmm. like that. But anyway, it, it kind of reminded me of what, what, what are we looking at here? Is this like a newel post to a bed or four poster bed or what is this thing? And uh, then seeing Mussolini's profile in here just made all the difference in the world. So <laughs> somehow it, um, it had a, a real important message for me. Uh, has it impacted perhaps indirectly on your work in the way that Millet's painting has? Probably had a backdoor influence, made me do other things. I didn't take that image and run with it, but um, it's, it's always been a, an important one to me. Whilst we're still in uh, the British chapter of this story, as it were, um, this slide is, it shows a series of prints that you made. You came to London a few years after. It's a separate trip, around about 1970. Yeah. Maybe you could just describe um, what we're seeing here, what the name of the pieces, because are they entirely legible, and uh, why you made them, and also what you made them from. Uh, all right, they're silkscreen prints that are uh, so big like this. Uh, they're titled from notions that I've picked up regarding London and England, like news, muse, pews, brews, stews, dues, and <laughs> newspaper tabloid country, uh, news, pews. What, uh, what's the muse? Muse, you did Muse, I, I had never heard of a muse <laughs> until we realized that that's like a little back alley uh, and um, a part of the urban environment, and we don't use that word in America. So, and pews was like Westminster Cathedral, brews was like ales and stuff. Brews, I guess, and, yeah. And brews and stews, uh, English uh, stews, let's say, uh, steak and kidney pie. <laughs> Dues, Robin Hood, unfair, tax, unfair taxation. So it was like a, a, a little run of thoughts about I, that I had for, about England, and all of the materials were, um, I kind of lost confidence in traditional materials like inks, and so I thought, I better do something else. And uh, how about using axle grease or caviar or things that I can make an image out of that will uh, push me off and, I don't know, down a different street well, so or a different you, muse. You, <laughs> you, you would, was, was it as spontaneous as that, that you, were, you, you came to London not knowing what you would do? I mean, this is on, in terms of some context, we've seen the pictures of the standard uh, gas station on fire, but also, you know, in the 60s, this is when you were really establishing yourself as an artist, creating these phenomenal works of art, mostly oil paintings, um, often featuring, I think, I believe this is the painting you say you're, you're most proud of, even today. Yeah. Um, which are all quite typical of what you were doing at the time, use of language, blank colours. Why did you then become disillusioned, as you say, with traditional ways of making uh, pictures? Uh, I guess you would call it fatigue, maybe. Uh, you know, I had done this for maybe 10, 15 years, and uh, I was very alert to the fact that I was putting a skin of paint onto a surface. And I thought, I'm, at this point, tired of putting a skin on a surface. So how about staining that surface? So 
these organic materials, I felt like they were really soaking into the paper. And uh, it, it went from there. I've been slightly battling with whether I should ask this next thing, but um, I'm going to go ahead anyway, because the, the nature of the course of empire cycle is that it takes, less so in your case than Cole's, but in both cases it's about the passage of time. And I think you're now 80 years old, and we're looking at works here which were made a long, long time ago. And I wonder how you feel when you look back over your career in terms of um, if we can take that analogy of the, s the course of the civilization, what, what, what stage of your career are you at um, when you look back? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I fit in this whole thing, and um, I uh, can't help but uh, uh, look back every so often, but uh, where to build on that, I don't know. And um, I just wake up in the morning and uh, have this... Uh, Everything is done out of an involuntary reflex, and so that's how I uh, seem to operate. And, and explaining it to myself or making it clearer to myself is uh, out the window. It's um, impossible. I can't make it any clearer to myself. So but I know you've said before that you, you feel actually great continuity um, with your 19-year-old self and preoccupations as a young artist. Uh, with what you do today. Is that, is that the case? Well, I don't know why. Maybe I said 18 or 19. I felt like I uh, had uh, emerged from some kind of uh, background that um, allowed me to see the world in a very clear way. And I'm always going back to that 18, 19-year-old self thinking that everything I do today is somehow connected to that period in my life. And um, I don't know, I think a lot of people might agree with me and feel the same way. What about the, the, the use of, um, the, the very prominent use of language that is so central to, to your art? How do you alight and, upon and choose the words that you decide to paint and depict? Um, well, they just come from <laughs> Every different source I can think of. Sometimes people will talk. I don't really watch television, so I don't. Not much comes off there. But, but movies, uh, radio things on the, that are happening on the radio. I'll, I'll, uh, uh, in polite conversation, uh, uh, the ramblings that people go through, uh, uh, things I read. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, these things just kind of come out of the air. And so it's I, unbidden almost. It's a, a, a phrase or a word suddenly just feels hot in some feels way. Feels good, and, um, and I have to kind of, uh, I've got m nervous fingers, and I have to make things official by making a painting or a drawing out of them. Since we're looking at this one, which I, uh, you, you said to me recently, this was the painting that you are perhaps proudest of having created. I wondered whether you might um, tell us why. What, what, just describe the elements here. There, there are two pencils, the word noise, and then what's the thing at the bottom? That's a, um, I call it Tencent Western. Uh, noise, pencil, broken pencil, cheap Western. Is the title. That's the title. And uh, I like the idea that all these subjects are, seem to be trying to escape the picture. You know, they're, <laughs> leaving. They're trying to leave the picture, but I stopped them in time <laughs> and, <laughs> and got them down. And, um, and I look back and like the way that I uh, painted this picture, I used a lot of wax in the paint. And um, I think maybe I picked that up from Jasper Johns. I, I uh, read that he used encaustic. Mm -hmm. And that made me run to the dictionary. <laughs> and it turned out that it was wax. And uh, somehow I used a lot of wax in this background, and it, it looks like a black background, but it's really a very dark blue. And uh, somehow I've just felt like, oh, there's some, maybe, maybe this painting is kissed by angels. I don't know. But I felt uh, uh, all through the years that maybe this painting is, is the, maybe the best painting I've done. 
could I ask, because I'm, I've always been fascinated that the rediscovery of Duchamp happens in Los Angeles, and you were there, and you were, were part of that. Has Duchamp been a big figure for you? Well, yeah, he was early on, and I, um, um, and it was the mysterious quality of his work, and so much has been written ad infinitum about explaining his uh, techniques and his, the, the reasoning behind his work and the, the importance of it, and, and I'd rather not read so much about him as just look at his works and let them be mysterious objects. Hmm. Do you feel frustrated by critics, curators, the types of people who create commentary around works of art? Um, do I feel... Well, from what you just said, that there's you know, that sense of the mysterious object of Duchamp. And it, it seems to me that a lot of your work has this very enigmatic, mysterious, quite cryptic quality, which, I mean, we could sit here and endlessly try to talk about why all those words begin with T. Um, I gave it a shot, but clearly it's slightly absurd. Um, and I wondered how, how you feel about um, how people should look at the work, respond to it, talking yeah. about art. Yeah, um, it's a, uh, the, well, Marcel Duchamp said that himself. He said the, the viewer is part of the experience of the work. And he was right about that. And I feel like uh, um, that there are coincidences that happen in, in the making of work. I, you know, I did this painting of a standard station, a uh, gas station, and then I did um, a painting of Norm's La Cienega restaurant. And uh, then Dave Hickey came along and said, aha, he's doing standards and norms. <laughs> and I, I couldn't argue with the guy, but I. <laughs> Despite your so his, it was yeah. his interpretation, and uh, but uh, these things are not really planned out, and they're they're done like I say from an involuntary reflex, and then pretty much forgotten about. And uh, yeah, I go back and look at them, sure, but um, the mystery is is always there. Do, do you remember anything of your mindset when you decided to create this? Because we have just a couple of examples here of a whole different aspect of your career. Your, these very famous artist books, and this particular one is, I think, the first one you created. Um, you can see it's called 26 Gasoline Stations, and it contains 26 fairly banal photographs of gas stations. They're not sort of artistic or mm. elaborate at all. Yeah. Why, do you remember why you were um, so compelled to create this thing? Um, actually, this is wrong. Uh, ah. that, that's from another book called Real Estate Opportunities. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's from that's, Real that's Estate true. Opportunities. But yeah, yeah. anyway, <laughs> the point, I, I understand the point. Yes, Here's hang on, hang one. on. That is a gas station. Yes, that's it is. Un yes. Unambiguously. Yes, yeah. it is, yeah. And... Uh, Oh, just traveling across country, which I love doing, and uh, driving on the highway, uh, you're a victim of gas stations anyway, so you gotta stop and <laughs> fill up with gas, and I began photographing these things, and uh, I amassed a collection of all these photographs, and I wondered what possibly I could do with these things, or what am I gonna just keep them in a box, or what? And uh, um, I had gone through school and learned uh, how to print and how to set type and uh, doing lettering, sign painting, um, uh, designing books, and so I just had this urge to somehow make a book, and uh, that was the most important effort, was to produce a book. It almost didn't matter what it was about, and I needed an excuse to make a book. And here was my excuse. <laughs> and uh, it kind of fell into place, and um, don't ask me why, maybe it's blind faith or something, but um, uh, I knew it was gonna be 26, and it was gonna be gas stations. <laughs> so, simple as that. What, what, what was uh, the reaction uh, to the book when it was first printed? Um, I, uh, well, I had 400 of these printed, and, um, 
and that was an exciting thing right there, just to have the the 400 books stacked up in front of me. And uh, what I didn't did you know, do with them? Well, I was hand them out to people, and uh, and I got some strange reactions. I mean. <laughs> If I gave one of these to uh, somebody who worked in a gas station, they'd be, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. But if you give this to somebody who is a uh, critic or a, possibly a poet, they might look at me sideways thinking, are you putting me on? <laughs> are you having me on? <laughs> so I got weird reactions from people, but uh, not something that I was seeking, but it's just part of the product, I guess. We, there's another example of uh, a later book here where um, this commemorated an event where you were speeding along a highway, I believe, with a friend, and the friend decided to th chuck a typewriter out into the road, and then collectively you sort of photographed this. You, you drove on, and then you returned to the, the, the scene of the crime, and then created um, almost like an investigative report on the death of the typewriter. Yeah. Um. Um, yeah, that was, um, um, I, I don't want to pop the bubble or anything, but we had a typewriter that was broken beyond repair, but it was all, it looked good, and, uh, and they had this notion to throw it out of the speeding car, and uh, drove on for maybe 50 miles or more, and then it dawned on us that there might be some substance back there. Mm. So a U-turn seemed to be the best kind of uh, motion to make. And that's what we did. We went back, and luckily we were with uh, our friend Patrick Blackwell, who had a camera and film, and we thought that this is the, this is the thing to do. Uh, almost in a, uh, like a, using forensic methods to go back and photograph all the little pieces and parts that we could find and where they landed and, and, um, um, and uh, of course, make a book out of it. Because we're slightly running out of time, I thought maybe we could just bring it back to Cole in a way. Um, these are more recent paintings that you created. I think they date from the 90s, where you started painting imaginary mountains, and in this case, again, of course, overlaid with, with words and strange evocative phrases such as lion in oil. Um, it has been said that if you think about Thomas Cole, and we can see in the exhibition downstairs, he was the founding father, if you like, of American landscape painting, this, this great believer in the sublime uh, landscape, the sublime wilderness. And some people see these paintings almost as a, a send-up, if you like, of that tradition. Is that how you see them? No, I don't. Uh, I, um, I, uh, I always, whenever I make a work, I, I always try to put a little soundtrack with it, as though it has maybe some music behind it. These things are like backdrops or stage settings, and what a better stage setting than a, than a mountain. And uh, the mountains are not painted like uh, a naturalist would go out, like Bierstadt would go out and set his canvas up and paint a mountain that he sees. And um, so I, I didn't, I never saw them this way. But I, I like to think of it as, uh, I mean, I'd rather think that my soundtrack to this painting here would be like two radio stations that were crossing over top of one another and they were out of sync. And even you get the scratchy <laughs> thing like that. Thomas Cole would have maybe religious music. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, those are the guidelines, I guess. Perhaps we These should also have uh, slightly bulging sides, if you, if you see that. <coughs> uh, oh, uh, yes. I, uh, and so you could call them um, shaped canvases almost. But, um, and I never liked shape, shaped canvases. But here I find myself using shaped canvas. And uh, I wanted to extend the sides a little bit so that it, it bulged and the painting kind of like almost reached out for you and um, give you a little silly millimeter more of a picture than you would ordinarily have. So 
you know, that's, that's, I guess, what I was thinking about when I did this. Um, perhaps this feels appropriate for our part of the discussion. Good. On that note, we should, we should uh, stop now. Thank you, Alistair, for a wonderful uh, uh, conversation. Thank but thank you, Ed, yeah. for leading us through your work. <laughs>